Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. In the days ahead, as our energy declines, we're going to be looking at the opportunity to share more of our resources with one another. My guest today here in Eugene, Oregon, has got a lot of practice at sharing and is going to be a model for us. I'm here with Tree Bresson. Thank you for joining us on Peak Moment. Thanks. So we've got sharing of all kinds, a household, which we can hear about, a car, which we can hear about, and, I, and even more in building community. So where do we start? You know a little bit about Peak Oil. Uh-huh, a little it, bit. Uh, it uh, sort of showed up on your radar screen a little bit ago? Seems like several years ago, I'm guessing. I don't quite remember the first what my first exposure to it was. I'm guessing it might have been through an email list that a friend of mine does. It often seems like it's about six months ahead of the yes, curve of yes. learning about issues and so on. Did you find that it changed any of your behavior or affirmed what you were doing or any of that kind of made you think about things you hadn't thought about? Um, I was already on the track of living you know, in these ways of um, sharing resources. I had done that um, out of a desire to try to live out as much of my values as I could. And so at an earlier time, and so learning about peak oil affirmed those choices and maybe added a little bit more urgency ah, to them, ah. you know? I think it, it helps keep me on the path. It's like, if I might think sometimes like, oh, group living, you know, kind of has its challenges and is it still worth it? It becomes one more reason to hang in there because so, in the future it seems like it's going to be even more important. I think a lot more people are going to be finding themselves living together, taking the big houses and sharing them, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. living more compactly mm -hmm. as we do more infill and, and the suburbs mm -hmm. are going to have to do some creative things. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. long have you been doing group living? Uh, I moved to my first community in the fall of 1994, so, so really that would be 12 years? Almost 12 years now. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So six, tell me, six years in this house. Six years, okay, six years almost, here with yeah. how many people live in this, this, okay, we need to describe this house a little bit. This is a lovely craftsman style home that was mm -hmm. built in the early 1900s, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and then they added to it. Mm -hmm. So I haven't even checked it out. How many, <laughs> how many bedrooms, how many people? With nine here? bedrooms total. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, so there are four bedrooms in the original section of the house and then another five bedrooms upstairs on the, in the other half of the house. That was added later. Right. Okay. So originally the house was a duplex. Oh. And when we started as a co-op, so they built two houses on the same lot adjoining but with no interior connection at all. I see. And when we started the co-op uh, in the summer of 2000, we kind of knocked out a wall and took, you know, made some changes to the interior space to enable it to be one large shared dwelling and okay. shared property instead of being, it actually had become two houses and a studio apartment. So there were three separate units. I see, I see. So we changed that to have it be one large place that we could share together. And we, for most of our history, have had nine people living here in the nine bedrooms. We currently have one couple that decided after meeting here and falling in love and getting together and they were sleeping always in one room and they said, well, after months of this, they were like, well, why should we pay rent on right, two rooms? Right. Why don't we share one? So now we have 10 of us that live here together in the house. And so, and so, since it was two houses originally, does that mean you have two kitchens? Right. Have you adapted those or you, you've... We use one as our main kitchen. Okay. And we use the other as what we call a personal foods kitchen. Oh, okay. So that, the personal foods kitchen allows people to have a little more flexibility in their food choices mm -hmm. or if they don't want to deal with having maybe so many people around in the morning for breakfast or something, you know, there's a place, nice. a place you can go. And specifically, we've chosen to have our common meals be vegetarian. So if you want to eat meat, then you can buy that with your own money and cook it in the second kitchen. And you can even bring it to the dining room table. As you can have right. it at the common meal. Right. But it's kind of prepared separately and kind of managed separately. And so, because we have vegans and vegetarians and omnivores all sharing. Well, that's um, so going to be the reality. You know. I mean, that's going to be the reality in the future. Is people do have specific food mm -hmm. needs to keep mm -hmm. themselves going. And mm -hmm. that's a nice mm -hmm. way to accommodate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you we had that luxury, so it helped everyone to be comfortable. It's really, yeah. that's, a, that's really sweet. Yeah. And the second dining room, we changed into a shared office space. Okay. So you all, yeah, I saw you had several computers yeah. out here in the, yeah. in the space. So so some people have laptops that. in their bedrooms mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. but for people who want public, a more public office space, we try to accommodate that. You mentioned um, eating together. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to that. What, what do you do in common? What do you do? You we have... do five dinners a week uh -huh. in common, Monday through Friday night dinners. And so somebody each, how we, do you work that? Everyone has one cook shift a week, so it's in pairs. Okay. There's 10 people, all right. and all right. so, um, so there's two people on each night together and you can either cook and clean both together or one of you might cook and the other one might bottom line doing the cleanup. Okay. So the, the pair who's working together week to week can div div divide the work however they want to divide it. And do people chip in together for the fund for the dinner? Yeah. The dinner uh, yeah. Well it's not just food? for the dinners, it's or actually for all of our food 
But if Other there's than something, the specials. Right. Other than the special if needs. If you want, um, you know, we don't cover beer and ice cream and um, what else don't we cover? You know, one person wants a certain kind of seaweed or, you know, or supplements or so anything that's sort of seen as more of like, well, it's more of one person's or it's more of like a luxury item. Those things we don't cover. But okay. all the basic staples we cover. And after six years of having our food budget, almost six years, at $110 per person per month, we've just raised it just a week or two ago for the first time. We've raised it to $130 per person per month. That's we still, buy all yeah. organic. Hey, yes. Yeah, and okay. as, as much bulk purchasing as we can. And we will subscribe in season to a community-supported agriculture uh -huh. okay. Okay. farm and be getting That's a great. share. In fact, this season we decided we wanted to support more local agriculture. Great. So we subscribed to two different CSAs. And that way we don't have all the vegetables come in on the same day. Aha, uh -huh. so, so you got your time pace. So yeah. You got, so, then, so then part of your cooking yeah. in, the, in the CSA season, which is what, mainly summer, fall, is mm -hmm. your CSA season. It starts, you know, late spring. That's yeah. true. May-ish. Yeah. Depends yeah. on how the rains go, right? Yeah. yeah. Then your, your, your cooks, your cooking mm -hmm. is going to be around, what did we get? Exactly. It's, so that you're having to be mm -hmm. creative in the moment and, and eating seasonally, yeah. which, yes. is, which is going to be healthier. Yeah. And we get some from the garden, but we haven't, you know, we're not as strong in that as some intentional communities that are growing a substantial portion of their food. Our, our garden tends to be more supplementary rather than something we form... Um, Strongly reliant. Now, is working on the garden something that everyone must do? Is that voluntary? Is totally voluntary. Okay. It's okay. just whoever feels moved to do it. And how do you does tackle? It? Since I have lived in a shared household for a mm -hmm. while, mm -hmm. we had to sit up and do. Uh, we, we worked out agreements. Mm -hmm. What do we, what mm -hmm. do we share, including the house chores, of uh, cleaning? Mm -hmm. So I, I tell us. I mean, how did you how did you work out? Yeah. those well, kinds of we're still arrangements. Working, we're still working it out. You know, even though we're six, six, years, six in, years in, I imagine and most okay. of us now, it hasn't been the same people for the whole six years, okay. but most of us that are here now have been at least two years and some, you know, four and five and six years and so on. Okay. So, um, and it changes, it changes depending on who's in and out and what mm -hmm. their needs are. So we try to have compassion with each other and understand. And we actually, it's funny that you mentioned about the cleaning because just yesterday we had a big, long meeting. We even invited in an outside facilitator. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We went off-site together because there had been some upset that had come up. And we said, you know, let's really focus in some attention on this. this um, uh, that was one of the first things that came up in the household is like not only to agree on what needs to be cleaned, mm -hmm. how often it needs mm -hmm. to be cleaned, mm -hmm. and the level of quality it needs to have. Right. And, right. and so I can imagine... And how do you respond when it doesn't happen? Exactly. All the, all that, the, and that's often the key thing. The it's like, well, then if I walk in the kitchen, you know, we had an existing set of agreements. So if I, you know, that we made in the beginning and then they carried for a while and then it's like, okay, if I walk in the kitchen, it looks like that's not happening. What are my options at that point? Yes. We talked about that at yesterday's meeting. We talked mm -hmm. about if my only options, as one person put it, he said, you know, if my only options are either I can clean it and feel resentful yes. or I cannot clean it and feel less resentful but more frustrated yes. he's like i need some more options what else can i do yes and yes. so you know we decided okay one of, so one of the well we spent the bulk of the meeting talking about each other's feelings and where people are coming from mm -hmm. and people's history mm -hmm. on the subject once we had done that to share our feelings together then the space is more opened up for creative problem solving yes and so yes. then the two things that we we're going to be talking about it more we're not done yet with the topic but um, and this was the most major revisiting of the topic we've had in a while. Like, so it goes for a while, mm -hmm, and then maybe mm -hmm, it needs to be revisited. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so the two particular things that we came up with are that we're going to have uh, an extra tub that's going to live in the kitchen that if you walk in and someone's dish is, you know, on the counter and you're wishing it wasn't there, you can just sort of stick it in the tub, and it's then it's kind of out of your way. Okay, okay. So, um, you know, now, of course, then the question is, how are those dishes in the tub going to get washed? That's right. Right? That's right. And we didn't have time at the meeting yesterday but at least to finish gotta, that. Uh, but we said it's one step forward. We didn't have to have the perfect solution. I think that that's part of what's going to be needed even more in the future, and it already is. We already live in times of great change. Yes, yes, There's not yes. stability a lot of times. And so people have to be willing to experiment to try something out, even if we're not all 100% convinced that it's the perfect solution. It's just it's the next forward. one. It's, it's exactly. like, which, which requires an enormous flexibility. I mean, yeah. imagine people are just like, yeah. who say, you need to get it resolved totally 100% right now and we never yeah. have to think about it again. It's, yeah. Those folks are gonna have a harder time. Have They're to gonna be go. stressed out. Some of us, like myself, who have stronger need for order and control, right, are right. gonna have to let go a little, right. yes. be a little more flexible. So, um, so, you know, so I'm working on growing into that. <laughs> And it's one of the things I like about group living is that it makes me grow. I can't just stay in my box. There's so many different ways. And of a doing way things. that's very different than its blood family. This is this yeah. is a because blood yeah. family yeah. we we excuse each other in different ways. We also yeah. can be harsher with other each other in different ways. Mm -hmm. 
in a chosen, a shared living, you there's a different set of social connections that yeah. you've got, a different set of agreements. Yeah. So, so of course, this, I mean, this gets into some of what you spend a good deal of your time with, but I'm going to get to that in a second. Yeah. I want to go for back for I want to go to another part of your sharedness. Yeah. And well, that's actually, can I mention one more idea that we came ah. up with yesterday because I'm excited about it. Okay, okay. Is that um we we said, well, how do we recognize and celebrate each other's efforts? Like here's an area ah. that we're you know, rather than just griping. Yes, yes. And so yes. we decided to have um, a piece of paper on the refrigerator and when you walk in, you can if you want to and you never have to, but if you feel so moved, you can write your name and the date and you write a little note and we decided to have it only be positive. Yes. Like we're not going to, okay. you know, we this have other, other ways to deal with no, an gripes and so on can be dealt support. with in other means. We're oh, not going to do that through written communication because that's often not a good way uh -huh. to share uh -huh. um, things that are emotionally charged. That's sort charged. of more permanent. You don't necessarily want to have that. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you were you were dorky when I, mm -hmm. and I got angry. Mm -hmm. You don't want to leave it there permanent because yeah. that moves as yeah. you let go of it. Exactly. You don't want it. But if I walk in and I feel like, wow, you know, I walked in and the kitchen is totally clean today and I'm happy about that. Then I can write a that's little a, note that says, sweet. hey, this looks great, you know, in the day and time so people know that that's when it was. Or, you know, maybe someone leaves, so we have, um, you know, the cleanup shift after the cooking, like this happened, you know, to someone last week, where they, um, they left for the evening and someone, else, and they said, hey, I'll finish my cleanup when I get back. And by the time they got back, someone else had done it. Uh -huh. They don't even know who. They can even thank whoever did yeah. the yeah. So at least so they put it on the put doors. Like, yeah, exactly. Thanks, whoever was the magic yeah, fairy that exactly. cleaned up my dishes. Yeah. And then he did someone else's the next day. You know? That's cool. So it's nice That's when there's a, that flow. It's really good. You get more generosity happening. Yeah, and so exactly. I think that you, you've, you've touched on two, two key things. How do we acknowledge the best in each other? Mm -hmm. How do we really support that? We forget that in our day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. And how do we mm -hmm. deal with it when, it's, when there's tension and, and, mm -hmm. and gripes? And I, I love your yeah. notion of... The written piece versus the oral. We in mm -hmm. our community house, mm -hmm. when things didn't work, and there were only four of us, so it's a lot, mm -hmm. a little simpler. Mm -hmm. um, had a weekly meeting, mm -hmm. and that that mm -hmm. was at the time where we'd say, you know, you mostly did it real well this week, but it fell down here, mm -hmm. and how, mm -hmm. you know, how do we how do we work mm -hmm. with that? Yeah, we have weekly meetings also, uh -huh. uh, two hours uh, yeah. per week, and um, but there's always more things to potentially talk about yeah, than sure. what there is time yeah. in those yeah. two hours a week, and so we need to have other other means also through which we're conveying, you know, some kinds of information, whether it's talking one on one or you know this thing on the fridge or something because it yeah. can't it can't all fit into. I those can believe not for that many things. people. Yeah, exactly. The ten of us so, is complex. So the other sharing because yeah. this, our time is just dancing away here. You're part of a car cooperative. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 tell us about this. How many people share this one car and what's the car and how does this work and how do you right. schedule all that? Yeah. So we're um, let me think. We we think of nine as being our sort of standard number, but we don't always have nine people sharing it. Sometimes it's seven or eight. And it could maybe be even, could go up to 10, mm -hmm. but some number mm -hmm. like that. It fluctuates depending on, sometimes people's needs change. This person gets this job, they think they need their own car to commute, they leave the car co-op, okay. you know, then their spot, you know, becomes open up for somebody else. All right. We do the scheduling via a website. How, how do people buy into, get into, I mean, how do you mm -hmm. handle that mm -hmm. side of beginning so, this? So our, um, we have a $400 buy-in. And if you leave the car co-op, then some, then the next person who comes in buys your share. So that's I refundable. See. Okay. And then we have to pay per person per month to cover mostly insurance, mm -hmm. and that is has been twenty dollars per person per month. Is that all? We've had struggles though with so many of us on a family policy, and so we had to bump up to a commercial policy mm -hmm. instead because the insurance company. So this is the thing about when you try to do cooperative things. The structures out in society don't, don't, you don't support fit. it. You're, you're in the correct. So it's like, you know, so for the housing co-op, we almost lost the thing over our inability to get insurance. Nobody would insure us because they don't have actuarial tables for housing co-ops, you know? <sighs> so we can't okay. get any company to offer coverage. So we finally found someone at three times the price mm -hmm. of when it was single owner, mm -hmm. you know? So it was a very mm -hmm. frustrating situation. Mm -hmm. And hopefully as these cooperative movements build and get stronger, we can be having sharing, you yeah. know, among co-ops to build these institutions, yes. to kind of build more alternative institutions is definitely part of what I see happening in the future. So our insurance payments recently went up with the car co-op and we're still figuring out what they're going to be. I think maybe 25, certainly no more than 40 is the that's, very most that's very that it's going to be per person per month. Okay. Then we pay 30 cents per mile and that includes the fuel. It includes the fuel. Right. Okay. That's including the fuel and we're fueling it with biodiesel fuel All that right. we are getting from there's a local distributor here in Eugene, 
that um, they're not making the fuel themselves. Mm -hmm. They're bringing it in, I think, from the Midwest, right. and then they're reselling it here. Okay, so, so, so it's a diesel, biodiesel, but you just, you, you're just you trying to use the biodiesel all the time. We try to use it all the time. If it's really cold out, we may have to put a few, we call it putting dinosaurs in. <laughs> <laughs> so, or if you're away on a trip really far away. Sure, and they don't have biodiesel, Right, of if you can't get sure. it. But we do, we carry quite a few fuel containers in the trunk as oh. well. So, like, I just went to Portland last week, which is a two-hour drive. So I drove, and I, the car had been filled up before. And so then I drove up there, and then before I left to come home, I took the containers in the trunk and refilled, and that way I could do the whole thing that's on right, biodiesel. Right. I think Portland does have biodiesel available, but I didn't know where it was or right, anything. Right, right. So, it made you know. it easier for you. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so you, you've got so that's the finances seven to of ten it. people. There's some finances. Yeah. There's a right. website now, scheduler. When you, when you have the, the car, mm -hmm. are you responsible for filling it up when you get done? How do you, how do, you do that No, part? it's more, we have, that's more one of the jobs that is parceled out. So we have the oh. whole group of us. And the group meets about once a month. Okay. Um, and there's different jobs in the group. So one person does the accounting, and someone else responds to inquiries from potential new members, and someone does the fueling, and someone does mechanical maintenance. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so these jobs can get traded around kind of as need arises. You know, maybe someone's been doing more work, and then they get busy with, maybe they're in school, and they get busy with their studies, and they say, well, okay, I need to, can someone else take over the fueling for a while? Okay. okay. And so we'll trade around. But there's an expectation that if you're in the car share, that you'll take some measure of work whether it's cleaning parties to help clean the car, whatever it is, that you'll kind of chip in um, and that you'll show up. If you're not at every meeting, at least you'll be at you know, most, most of the, of, most okay, of the meetings. Okay. Or, or if you can't be for a while, let people know what's going on in your life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, that was one mm -hmm. of the things that I think that we did that has made it work really well. I mean, kind of amazing to me. We've been operating this car co-op for three years now. I don't think there's ever been a single major upset or conflict like wow. about scheduling or anything. And I think that part of that, as we said from the beginning, you know, we want to stay connected with each other on a human level. It's not just this material thing. Ah, uh, so, so it's the business arrangement. It's people you want to continue having a relationship exactly. with in a way. Exactly. That's a very different model than a, than just a business. Exactly. So we might go to a pub together, or we might have potluck together, or we might yeah. have an anniversary on the first year, you know, yeah. celebrating yeah. the car yeah. co-op, or if I need a ride, I'm going out of town for work, and I need a ride, you know, somewhere to get to the train or uh -huh. the airport uh -huh. or something, that I might, you know, send email out to the rest of the group saying, hey, I need to drop off at this time. Can anyone else do it? Can, so the, people the, really so come through ride for each other. So you use ride sharing as well. Oh, then. yeah. And definitely carpooling and so on, and... Oh, yeah. That's fabulous. Yeah. Now, does everybody in your co -op, car co-op live nearby? Are you at different places? We're spread across town. Are you really? Yeah, we're spread okay. across town. And so we've now what we're doing is we're alternating every other month. On the even-numbered months, it's parked on the east side of town. Uh -huh. On the odd-numbered months, it's parked on the west side of town. Then if it's on your other side of town, then like I'd have to bike over to the west side on the I east see. side. I see. So I'd leave my bike locked up over there, take the car, drive around bring the car back, and then bike home. How do you schedule? Tell me about the schedule. So we have a website Yay. that was created by one of our members. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate, I think, when we started that we had people with a variety of skills. So, you know, we had someone who could do, you know, write code for, you know, to create the scheduler. Okay. You know, we had someone else who, um, you know, was really experienced with bookkeeping and, and so, so on. Is so that schedule kind of on, online in a place that everybody can it's see? It's on a website. Oh, it's so, on the website. So, so anybody can, can see it and, log and modify in. it. Uh -huh. Exactly. And okay. so, you know, like like today I, you know, logged in and I was like, oh, I wonder if the car is free for such and such day. And it was already scheduled for that day, so I'll have to find a different option. But then for a second trip I wanted to book, it was open. Uh -huh. And so uh -huh. and it's been pretty open. No one part of why our car share succeeds with so many people is because no one uses the car as their primary form uh, of transportation. That make a difference. We're so you all need for your bicyclists, bikers, you know, okay. bus people, you know, walk. Other kinds of transportation are primary, and the okay. car use is secondary. That's a so we big factor. Choose people who have think. that lifestyle already, yes. who are an amenable mm -hmm. fit, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, who can mm -hmm. come in easily mm -hmm. to make an easy mesh. You mentioned that that software is available if other people want to start car co-ops. We'd be really happy to share it. That was part of our desire That's in starting wonderful... this car co-op. wasn't just to share a car ourselves. It was to create a replicable model okay. and help start other groups. And in fact, we're even considering there may be, like, within this next year, there may be a spinoff group. Like, we may have an east side car share and a west side okay. car share separate. Okay. So, so yeah, and we're running, it's an old, you asked what kind of car also. So it's a 1983 Mercedes, which right. is kind of, you know, yeah. it's kind of a classic kind yeah. of car for this yeah, kind of thing. So. for sure. Yeah. Now, now, give us your website. What is it? Biocarshare.org. Okay. And anybody can log on and learn about how, yeah. you, you know... The like read our, read our core agreements and now, see Now, how did you buy in. the vehicle in the first place? How did that 
how did that, I mean, that's going to be a financial investment there. Well, that, so that's the buy-in. Okay, so your buy-in is towards paying off, paying, a, exactly. paying for a vehicle. And hopefully towards putting some money into replacement costs. Of course. Yeah, you know, depreciation I so. And so on. And we originally estimated too low. We thought that a $250 buy-in would be enough. Uh, and so we all put that amount in. We got the car. It turned out that the person who had inspected it to see what kind of shape it was in had done a lousy job. Car needed much more money in than mm -hmm. what we expected. Mm -hmm. So, you so we, bumped, your, we did an additional up, yeah. assessment. And then, um, and plus some of our members put in extra loans to help cover over and above as needed to kind of float it a little bit. Those loans are getting paid back over time. So, so um, in addition to the share that you buy, are people paying a, month, a monthly fee just to be, that's part of paying off that vehicle? Um, no, just the, they get, just, well, the mileage. The mileage. Yeah, because the monthly fee is really just covering insurance at this point. Right. So, but the per mile, as long as the car is getting used a lot, then some of the some per of mile is cost going towards is going to go towards that. Of, exactly. It. Okay. Yeah. I just, you've got to cover all the bases yeah, here, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. We only have about six minutes left, which is, which is going to feel too few, but I wanted to touch base mm -hmm. a little bit with you and your work with intentional communities, uh -huh. co-housing. Tell me about that, because I think we're going to see a lot more of that need. Yeah. Um, I mean, communities are a wonderful way. Basically, when we share resources, then we can all have enough. There can be a sense of abundance. Let's say that again. When Let's we say share resources, resources, we can, we can all, all have, have enough. enough. I mean, that's that's yeah. the, that's the total opposite of our American or our Western dream. It's like we have a lot of haves who have right. A so lot, here we have ten have people. Have we have one. You know, the ten people in the house have one washing machine, one dryer, clotheslines in the backyard. We try to do solar. So, so this is the anti-consumerist way of life. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, so community living is, um, even though it has its challenges, because as Americans, we grow up in the individualistic, acquisitive yes. culture, we're not taught to share, so it's a, it's a stretch. I think it's a stretch that's well worth making, just from both a personal growth standpoint and from an ecological standpoint, sure. so it's sure. kind of the place where those can meet. And um, the, but for a lot of people, because people do grow up being used to having their own space, not everyone, but for a lot of people mm -hmm, in this country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, it's interesting to see that the growth sector of the community's movement in the past decade has been co-housing. And in co-housing, you, st you still have individual people own their own unit. Uh -huh. And then uh -huh. there is a common house that maybe has dinner two to five times a week, and there's a kid's playroom, and there's laundry, and there's some guest rooms, and some, you know, a meeting room, and, you know, shared so it's facilities. So an in-between kind it's of in -between. thing. And between, that has is between been comfortable for a lot of people. I can imagine yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because an intentional community, you are asking for a level of, of interaction with one another, living in each other's spaces. Well, there's a huge habits. variety of intentional communities. Well, tell you me. know, there are land trusts where, you know, um, like I once visited a land trust where people's, the extent of their formal interaction was a potluck once a month. And otherwise, they were just doing their own thing. Uh -huh. We still sort of think of that as an intentional community because they had bought the land together and put it into community land trust or something. Okay. And, okay. you know, whereas in this house, it's, you know, we're sort of in each other's faces more. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Formerly, mm -hmm. the first community mm -hmm. that I lived at um, was a full income sharing commune out in the country where we ran businesses together, you know, and shared, you know, our income as well as sharing expenses. Uh -huh. So income that came in went into the common pot and we all, you know, Boy, that gives you a to help whole other level that. of stuff that you're going to have to deal intense. with. Woo. Much more when you've got financial. So well. yeah, so I mean, you know, to me, this is light by comparison with yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so there's all different points on the spectrum of community living and all different types and varieties. And I think it's great that there's that diversity. Yes. People yeah. can find what works for them. And one metaphor that I really like that I, from um, Laird Schaub, who's involved with the Fellowship for Intentional Community. He says that um, intentional communities, including co-housing as a type of intentional community, that intentional communities are the R&D centers, the research and development centers for the culture at large. Woo, nice. It's Here, where yes. we learn how, how to do... deal with the things that we need to be learning That's in the culture. That's a good point of view. Yeah, and specifically how to hold each other during times of difference. You know, how do we stay in relationship even when we are want very different things on the surface mm -hmm, or when we're really mm -hmm, frustrated mm -hmm, with each other. Mm -hmm, How do we stay mm -hmm, connected mm -hmm. at the human level? And mm -hmm. that's a lot of what my work is about, of, is supporting groups. Now I've learned enough of this from living in community for years and getting my, you know, butt kicked enough, say, you know, all, all the that, shoulders. Exactly, yes. all the feedback and all yes. the growth and all yes. that, that, you know, now I feel like, okay, I've learned something about how to support other groups and so I travel around helping. Uh -huh different intentional community groups to work through their conflicts and teaching them skills for making decisions by consensus okay. in a way that is inclusive while, you know, that holds all the voices while still moving forward and getting things done. Because I can, you know, I've, you can, you can attempt to do consensus and be stalled out. Absolutely. Trying to get there. Exactly. It's gotten forward. a bad rap, I think, you know, because people have had so many bad experiences right. of doing it in groups right. that didn't have training and didn't have skills. 
we wouldn't try to do Robert's Rules parliamentary procedure with no, without even knowing what the rules are and without having the skills for it. And yeah, consensus yeah. is similar. There's some basic skills that need to be in place that once people get the framework, you know, then they can move forward with it in a more effective way. So I'm traveling around supporting groups doing that. And there's a number of other traveling facilitators who kind of specialize right. in supporting it, intentional community groups. I mean, we only have about yeah. two minutes left, and I feel yeah. like we could talk for another half hour here. <laughs> so I want to make sure, any other last gems in this last couple minutes that you want to make sure to share with people is if they're thinking about more shared arrangements like you've been doing, what have you learned? Get help. Get help. There are resources support each other. Like communities can trade facilitators back and forth on a wow. barter arrangement. Don't try to like go it alone. That it used to be maybe 30 years ago, if someone was starting a community, there weren't necessarily resources That's to true. support it. That's true. And now there is, should I hold up some of the oh, sure. things here? Sure. So we have sure. um, Communities Magazine, which comes out uh -huh. quarterly. And so okay. this was an issue that was actually on the peak oil um, dilemma yeah, and that's how intentional a... communities are going to be facing that. Yes. So, yes. Um, so there's that. There's also the community's directory um, in you print and also online. Uh -huh, so there's uh -huh. the main portal website for community living is um, IC, like intentional community. Okay. So it's www.ic.org. Okay. And if you just plug community into a search engine, it's probably the top site that's going to come up. Okay. So we have now the community's directory has also been put totally online. These are both oh, resources resource. created by the Fellowship for Intentional Community that supports community living of all kinds. Really? It holds In America conferences, or North America, North America? And okay. is also connected with organizations doing it elsewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So there's that. There's also a wonderful book by Diana Leaf Christian called Creating a Life Together. Diana Leaf Christian. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful cover. Look at yeah. this. Practical from, tools to grow eco villages and intentional communities. So it's how to start a community, basically. Ah. So this is a resource. This is just out within the past few years that she put this together. And it's from New Society Press. And this is a resource that takes a whole bunch of wisdom Big. and knowledge about how to succeed in starting a community. And it just can save groups so much time and frustration. So I think go around, look at other communities, see what they've done, see what worked and what didn't work, see what you might want to draw from. Get involved with the networks of people that care about community living to help, you know, to get support because it's just, it's too much to take on, you know, trying to do it alone. And the whole essence of community anyway is it's, cooperation it's and mutual support. communities. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. being in our R&D. Thank you for this sharing, <laughs> the wonderful models of, of sharing at different levels mm -hmm. and for helping other groups in your work facilitating. Well, this has been a peak moment. You're watching Peak Moment, Community Responses to a Changing Energy Future. I'm Janae Donaldson. Join us next time.